Hey everyone, today we're going to talk about what's on everyone's mind, the novel coronavirus or COVID-19, but we're going to talk about it in relation to the Parkinson's community. Like you, I've also been closely following this global pandemic that we find ourselves in. The novel coronavirus, or COVID-19, as it sort of sweeps across the world, infecting people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, in the last several months. We've sort of been inundated with a whole lot of information about this pandemic, what we know, what we don't know. But in the past week or so, I've received a few questions from people in our community that ask, is there anything special that they need to know um, between uh, coronavirus and Parkinson's disease? Is there any added risk for them in terms of developing the disease or um, developing a serious complication should they be infected with the virus? Well, the answer is we really don't know. Uh, I mean, we don't have any evidence to say that having Parkinson's disease in and of itself puts you at an increased risk for complications from coronavirus. It doesn't seem to be in otherwise healthy individuals, but there are a few caveats to that. For instance, I happen to have young onset Parkinson's disease, but most people in our community um, get this disease when they're much older. And we know that um, those individuals that are over the age of 60 or 65 tend to be at higher risk for getting complications from a coronavirus infection compared to someone younger. The other thing that happens as we age is we tend to get other illnesses like heart disease or lung disease. And those types of added illnesses also put you at an increased risk for serious disease should you contract coronavirus. The third thing is that sometimes with advanced Parkinson's disease, we may have certain symptoms that may put us at higher risk. For instance, um, if you're in advanced Parkinson's, you may have difficulty swallowing and that may lead to aspiration, which compromises your lung function. Add in an infection like coronavirus into that sort of system and, and you really could suffer more complications from the disease. But regardless, at the end of the day, Parkinson's disease in and of itself, at the moment, from what we know, doesn't seem to increase your risk for serious disease should you be um, infected with coronavirus. That having been said, we all know, you and I both know, that any illness um, can obviously offset our symptoms. Meaning, if we get a flu or a cold, our symptoms tend to be more pronounced, our medications don't work as well and we tend to get more off times, and that's just a reality that we live with. The same would be if we were to get a coronavirus infection. The good thing is about that is that usually after the infection or what other added illness resolves, um, we usually go back to our baseline normal, which is a great thing. So what can we do? Well, we can't really talk about COVID-19 without talking about how we can reduce transmission or reduce our risk for infection. So this comes to just sensible things. If you have symptoms, don't go out in public. Even if you don't have symptoms, try and stay home as much as possible. Avoid large crowds, avoid small venues such as bars or nightclubs or, or gyms, for instance. Um, and try and work as much as you can from home so you don't have to enter the workplace as frequently. The other part of reducing transmission is what we call social distancing. This basically means keeping a distance of about six feet between you and any other person. Why is that? Well, coronavirus is spread through droplets. And if someone coughs or sneezes, or even talks or laughs, they can release those droplets into the air. And if you're within a six foot radius of that individual, then there's an increased chance that you could contract it. But by keeping your distance of at least six, sometimes 10 feet away from an individual, it greatly reduces your risk of transmission and infection. These are all small little things. The other thing is hygiene. Hand washing is really important. Um, simple soap and water works very well, but you have to wash your hands correctly, meaning getting every nook and cranny, um, and do so for about 20 seconds at least before you rinse your hands. And if you're not around a sink, then something as simple as a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol is always a good bet to help disinfect your hands as well. Cough into your elbow or your um, arm instead of your hands, um, or if you use a tissue, dispose of it right away. All these little things can really help 
reduce your chance for infection and also reduce the transmission of the um, disease across the community. So that's how we can help reduce transmission of COVID-19 and also protect ourselves from infection. The next part is about being prepared to sort of ride out the next wave of, of this infection. And a lot of us have done prep work. We've bought extra groceries, extra sundries, lots of toilet paper seems to be on everyone's mind. We also need to think about our Parkinson's. What we can't live without at this point in time is our medications. And you never know when you may not be able to go to the pharmacy or there may be a break in the supply of your meds. So it's a good idea to stock up on those if you can. I personally um, have and recommend that you get at least three months worth of your prescriptions if at all possible. A lot of insurance companies and pharmacies are kind of relaxing the restrictions that they usually have. Oftentimes they won't give you any more than 30 to 60 days of your meds at any one time. Um, but now they're starting to relax those restrictions so that you're able to sort of stockpile a uh, supply for you at home. The other thing you might be looking at um, getting for your house is um, over-the-counter medications that may help you should you develop any symptoms of cough or, or congestion or fever. There's a few things that with Parkinson's you have to be careful of. The first is medication interactions. If you're on something like resagiline or sledgiline or sulfenamide, um, those medications actually can interact with common decongestions such as pseudofedrin or ephedrine or cough suppressants such as dextromethorphan. So that is something that you need to know about and instead of just picking up things off the counter and taking them home, ask the pharmacist, give him a list of the medications that you're, him or her, the list of medications that you're already on to see and make sure there's no drug interactions between what you've chosen and what you're already on. Um, the other thing is there's some literature or there's some recommendations that are coming out of primarily France but are being corroborated by other researchers that perhaps NSAIDs such as ibuprofen aren't the best idea when you're trying to control a fever in the setting of coronavirus. That maybe something like acetaminophen is, is better for you to take. So that's something also that is evolving. The recommendations are evolving. It's something to keep track of. But perhaps pick up some acetaminophen instead of NSAIDs if you're trying to look for something that will control fever. The next thing you need to prepare is organizing your help. For some of us in the community, we live on our own or we may need help with meal prep, groceries, other activities of daily living, and we get that help from outside sources. So you really have to call your home health care provider and discuss with them what safety precautions are they taking, what risks um, are they trying to um, mitigate, how are they changing their practice to keep you safe. And if you feel that you can uh, rely on that help, then definitely do so. There are also other things. Think outside of the box. Enlist the help of family and friends. Think about a meal delivery service or a grocery delivery service, for instance, that might keep you at home safe and still get the help that you need. So what do you do about your medical care? Because obviously you're going to require something over the next few months. Well, just to back up and talk about coronavirus, if you get symptoms of coronavirus and you're wondering about it, then you need to follow whatever your local public health authority says you need to do. Um, if you have severe symptoms of coronavirus, um, difficulty breathing, high fever, and you need attention, then obviously go to the emergency room to get assessed and, and treated. But if you just happen to need follow-up, a regular appointment, nothing major is going on, you don't necessarily want to, in the middle of a pandemic, go to a medical office because you could potentially be putting yourself in a situation where you're with other people that are carrying the coronavirus. So call your family physician or your neurologist or your movement disorder specialist, whoever is giving you your primary health care, and discuss with them because a lot of offices have already put in place different ways of communicating and, and treating their patients. It may be telemedicine where you can actually have a video conference with your physician or it may just be over the phone, renewal medications can happen over the phone and that sort of thing. So try and see what your physician or your medical team already has in place to help you stay at home and stay safe instead of having to go to see them directly face to face. And in the off chance you do happen to be hospitalized, it's probably good to be prepared for that kind of eventuality. Um, 
make a list of your medications, a schedule of your medications, even have some medications set aside that you could take with you, have emergency contact numbers available, and also a list of your healthcare professionals would be great as well, just in case you need to. So those are some of the things that we need to do in order to prepare to ride out um, this wave of, of coronavirus infection. But what can we be doing on a daily basis? Well, the first thing I must say is you cannot ignore your self-care routine. Exercise, nutrition, sleep, stress management, all these things together improve your general health. They improve your general health, your sense of well-being, and probably your immunity to some extent. So you may have to modify some of this because you may not be able to get out to your boxing class or your, or your Pilates class or your dance class. So you may have to improvise a little bit, think outside the box, go outside for walks, um, do um, online exercise classes. A lot of physios are actually offering um, online exercise classes for free for individuals that aren't able to come uh, to group classes anymore because of the social distancing uh, restrictions that we have. But overall, maintain your self-care routine and you will be far better able to cope with both the um, isolation that you have right now, um, being at home, and also your general well-being as well. Another thing that I think is really important is, and this is also part of self-care, is avoiding social isolation. Parkinson's disease in and of itself can be socially isolating, and you add in the restrictions that we have right now about staying at home, and that it, could, it compounds that problem. Social distancing doesn't necessarily equal social isolation. There are many ways that you can keep connected in this day of technology, um, online chat groups, um, video telephone calls with, with your friends and family, even though you can't make, meet face to face, that kind of interaction is very helpful. Reaching out to your community. There are people that are vulnerable, just like you, that may be at home um, without much um, interaction with other people that may be suffering from their anxiety or depression and maybe have difficulty coping. And those individuals could certainly help, uh, could certainly benefit from your help, your advice, your assistance, and you could really make a big difference um, in another person's life, which is rewarding in and of itself. So keeping motivated, keeping uh, socially active as much as possible in the context of this kind of social distancing is difficult, but it's an important thing to do. Speaking of giving comfort to others, we also have to manage our own anxiety. It's a lot. It's a lot to be presented with these ever-increasing numbers, seeing people in your own community being affected by this. It can really aggravate and, and make worse somebody's underlying anxiety and depression. Um, and it's important to recognize that stress can, can do that to you. Um, I would say the important thing is to um, maintain those activities that you find help manage your anxiety, such as mindfulness, meditation, the relaxation techniques, things that work for you, you may need to sort of turn to a little bit more often these days. If you're not able to manage your anxiety, then a phone call to your physician is probably warranted. They may be able to make some small changes in your medication dosage or something like that, or they may be able to offer you some advice that may prove to be helpful to you. So hopefully you found something interesting and helpful in this vlog. Uh, it's a very strange and extraordinary time that we're living through at the moment. But my most um, important message to you is really stay calm, stay informed, and most of all, stay safe. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see future vlogs, then please hit the subscribe button below. If you have any ideas of things that you would like to, me to cover, then please mention it in the comment section below. Until next time.